morning, New Hope. Our 14-day financial fast is here, and we're excited about it. Join us Monday, October the 3rd through the 17th, as we take a financial journey together. As you know, New Hope is entering into a unique season with big vision, and we are committed to do our part. For the next two weeks, we want to embrace this financial time of fasting as we align our hearts and focus on current practices on how we can better represent God as we continue to build faith and share love. We have brochures in the foyer and in our church app that will provide you some tips and encouragement on how to successfully complete this journey. It all begins tomorrow. Get ready. Let's go, New Hope reaching for a better future. Hey, New Hope, do you want to learn how to make your money work for you? Become a better financial steward and be a blessing? You're invited Tuesday and Wednesday, October 4th and 5th at 6.30 p.m. as we listen and glean from financial experts on how to maximize what God has given us. We encourage you to come and bring someone with you. We can all use assistance managing our money better. We will have class for all of our youth. Bring the family and join us this week, Tuesday or Wednesday in Conway and North Little Rock at 6.30 p.m. We'll see you there. Our 95th church anniversary is up on us. And it's no question, God has been so good to us. But let's kick off the weekend right. And you know how we do it, we celebrate. We'll have our church picnic at the Glenview Community Center next door. We have food, fun, and games. Come out, family and fellowship. We want to see you there. Then, on Sunday, our church anniversary will climax with Pastor Carlos L. Kelly of the Beulah Land Baptist Church. He will preach our 8 a.m. service, and our special guest will be the Reunion Choir. Dr. Terry Mackey of Pilgrim Progress Baptist Church of Phoenix, Arizona will preach our 945 and 1130 a.m. services. We are sure to have a good time. You don't want to miss it. God is doing great things here and it only gets better. New Hope, we invite you to get connected and stay connected to one of our many social platforms. We invite you to get connected on Twitter and keep up with the latest happenings at New Hope. Become our friend on Facebook and see what we've been doing in our community. Watch us on YouTube where you can hear clips and sermons from Pastor Parks. New Hope Social Media, building faith, sharing love. Four zero four zero. Our scripture comes from Matthew's chapter fourteen. I mean chapter um, twenty five, verse fourteen. For it would be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two more, made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settle account with them. 
And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said, unto, said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, he also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slow for servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seeds? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give to him who has the 10 talents. For to everyone who, who, who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servants into the outer darkness in, the pl in that place that will be weeping and garnishing of his teeth. Let us pray. Our God, our Father, we thank you this morning for another day that you have made. We thank you for carrying us on all this week. We thank you most of all, God, for carrying us from the beginning of this year until now, God. We thank you for watching over our homes, our families. We thank you for even watching over our enemies, oh God. God, we lift up the bereaved family. We lift up the sick and shut in, those that's in the hospital, those that is going through chemo and going through radiation, God. We lift them up before you right now in the name of Jesus because we know, God, that you can do more with it than the doctors can, God. Even when the doctor said, there's nothing else I can do, God, you step in because of our faith, oh God. We love you, we honor you, and we praise you for this day. We ask that you touch our pastor as he brings forth the word of God. And God, we ask that you just cover this service under the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Come to praise God. God gave his only son Jesus for us. I know that it's early in the morning, but it's time for us to sacrifice so we can give back to God. We just want to give him thanks.
concerning you. Is there anyone here that has a reason to give God thanks? Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Listen, church, every first Sunday we come before the Lord's table. This is a grateful memorial meal where you and I get a chance to pause and to reflect and remember what the Lord has done for us through his son, Christ Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and stain. 
And when we come before the Lord's table, it is a reminder that we are to always be reminded to confess our sins. Because the reality is we are indeed sinful people. Not sinful persons, but we all are sinful people because the Bible reminds us for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this is a reminder to the body of Christ, your sin might not be someone else's sin. And someone else's sin might not be your sin. But one thing that is undeniable is that we've all sinned. And it reminds us that we are all in need of a Savior. So let's pause for a moment and pray to God for the forgiveness of sins. And also thank God for thanksgiving of the fruit of the vine and the bread that is representative of his blood and body for us. Lord, we thank you today for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We thank you today, God, that we are indeed forgiven. We know that it is always the enemy's tactic to get us to walk around in guilt but we thank you today for the forgiveness of sin and we have the right to the tree of life. So now God, we thank you today as we come before this table and we come with grateful hearts and in a celebrative mood for the sacrifice of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and everybody said, Amen. Congregation, today you will be served. The ushers will lead you around. So I'm asking that all would stand. And the ushers, our hospitality, will be so gracious to guide you around.
On that night, Jesus took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, this bread represents my body that will be broken for you. Let us all eat together. Then Jesus lifted the cup and said, this cup represents my new covenant that I will establish with you. Without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sin. It is through the blood of Jesus that takes our dark souls and makes them white as snow. And we stand before Jesus Christ forgiven and justified. Let us all drink together. The Bible says they sung a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. I believe this morning there's no better name to sing other than Jesus. Let's sing it with uplifted voices. All over the building, oh Jesus. that the Lord has made, we choose to rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord on today? 
God is great and he is greatly to be praised. Church, quickly let me share with you. This is the month of October and in the month of October, do we have any birthdays? Any birthdays? Come on, stand up October birthdays. God's richest blessings to each and every last one of you. God bless you and happy birthday. Any wedding anniversaries in the month of October? Wedding anniversaries. God bless you on your nuptials, and we pray that this is a time of renewed refreshment and commitment to your anniversary in the month of October. Let's give God praise for the birthdays and anniversaries that we celebrate in the month of October. Listen, church, this month, is church anniversary month. Our church turns 95 years old and we are grateful. I want all of us to make our commitment to be here if possible, if you can, every Sunday of the month of October. We have so much planned for our church during this month and also this serves as a pivotal time for us to continue to look futuristically in the life of our church on Friday and Saturday. Our staff, we've been in retreat and talking through plans for the church for next year. Let's give God praise for that. So listen, if you see a staff member tired today, give them grace. They have been with the pastor all day Friday and all day Saturday. Amen. So give them grace. And then also on next Sunday, a part of our church anniversary, we will celebrate Sister Kay Riddle. She will be retiring from children's ministry 25 years. She's here. Stand up, Miss Kay. 25 years with our children. 25 years and have served under three pastors. That is major commitment. And uh, I know so many parents, you want to bless her and thank you because many of your children came to know about Jesus, your niece, your nephew, through the commitment of Miss Kay and her team. So we'll celebrate her the end of our 9.45 service in Conway and our 11.30 service on next week. We look forward to that. And then on the third Sunday is uh, rep your, uh, your church merchandise. You know, listen, New Hope, we got more church t-shirts. We got all kind of stuff, y'all. We got pins. We, we, and I got some more stuff coming for y'all a little later on. But uh, we, we got it. So third Sunday, make sure you rep your church with all type of merchandise, and then next Sunday we'll share some new things uh, that we have uh, coming out as well. And then the Sunday, the Saturday before our church anniversary, we'll have an old school church picnic right here on the campus of our North Little Rock campus. And listen, I want you to bring your friends, Lolly Dolly and everybody, uh, Deacon Hill and Brother Steve is working hard and feverishly on that. And then on the fourth Sunday, fourth Sunday at our eight o'clock service, that's reunion and homecoming service, amen. Pastor Carlos Kelly will be preaching for us Sunday at eight o'clock, amen. And the New Hope Reunion Choir will be singing at the eight o'clock service. And we will be honoring some of our members who have been pillars in the life of our church. And then at our 945, 1130, we will just simply be celebrating. And the Reverend Dr. Terry Eugene Mackey from the Pilgrim Rest Church of Phoenix, Arizona will be preaching. Amen. And then, and then we're going to really celebrate church anniversary by our members going to the polls to vote early. Amen. So we have a a lot planned and I'm moving quickly because the choir has been on their feet for about 32 minutes that's a long time and uh, but I want to share this with you on last Sunday last Sunday we launched our revealed our church's capital campaign reaching for a better future if you weren't here last week uh, simply raise your hand our ushers will be happy to provide you with a brochure for you simply to understand what it's all about. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand high. And then if you're electronic, it is already in our church's app. It's in our church's app, New Hope BCAR. Simply take time to read over that, pray over that, and I share, we'll share more about that as we get ready for our spiritual journey beginning today because we can't do anything of this magnitude outside of prayer. 
Our church will be an intentional time of prayer. And I want you, but I really want you to make sure you educate yourselves on what this capital campaign looks like, what it's for, what it's about, and why are we doing it now, amen? That's very important, why are we doing it now? So I look forward to you engaging. That you have any questions, feel free to email us uh, at the church office, and we'll be happy to respond to you. Church, let's make our hearts ready to give. <laughs> Make our hearts ready to give church. Now, as we, as we get ready to approach, we are approaching this final quarter of the year. Listen, I want to be clear. I want to be plain. I want to be uh, very frank. I need us to be consistent in our giving. Amen? Not reverend, because you're not giving a reverend. Your church needs you to be consistent in our giving. You know, we don't do all that walk around for offering anymore. Amen. And some of us, we get all of what God has for us and we just walk right out the door. And that's it's fine. You know, you know, we love you just the same. But amen. But if you know God is blessing you and you're receiving the word and we know what it is to be obedient to the word here at this church, we know what that looks like. You, we, we taught it, we preached it, and we don't, we don't result to games and gimmicks. We believe, obey the word, and we'll see God work in our lives. Amen? So I simply just want to remind us, I want to remind us, let's be diligent in our giving, especially in this last quarter of the year. Let's end strong so we can meet all of our numbers, so we can end the year in the black. Somebody shout, in the black. Amen. Amen. Are you ready to give, church? Amen. Amen. Repeat after me. My tithe is the debt that I owe. My offering is the seed that I sow. Lord, I trust you with my money. This is a sign that I trust you with my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's thank God for all of our members who are worshiping with us via live stream. Amen. If you love a good hymn, raise your hand. This next song is simply a remake of the hymn. The title starts like this. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promises. Just to know thus saith the Lord. And we just want to encourage y'all to continue to trust God. Turn to somebody and say trust him.
Come on, let's thank God for the voices of hope leading us in worship on today. Church, a couple of things. First, let me pause and recognize all of our first-time friends. If this is your first time worshiping with us, would you just wave? We don't want to put you on the spot, but we're just grateful for your presence. Thank you. I see first-time friends here and there. Thank you. Thank you. You have so many choices where you can go and worship God. We thank you for choosing New Hope as your place of worship. Hey, there's a QR code right there in your pew. If you didn't get a chance to stop at the front desk, we simply want a little information from you so we can tell you thank you for hanging out with us on today. Let's give our first time friends a great big hand. Maybe our hospitality is coming to put something in your hand right now. Any recurring friends, recurring friends, recurring. Thank you. We believe if God has you to keep showing up, God has something for you. First time friends, wave one more time. Our hospitality is looking for you. All right, there they go. Right, right there. Two here, two there, one on this side. One on this side, Renee. Thank you. Church, I want to begin a new series today entitled Securing the Bag. We live in a society where it requires money to live. Amen. Uh, we, we, we can't say uh, when we go to Kroger, I'm walking by faith and not by sight. When, when, when you go to that Shell gas station, they are expecting some cash. Uh, and prayerfully, you, you don't have to use credit to get gas, prayerfully. And uh, we, we wanna talk about what does it mean and what does it look like to manage God's resources? 
I, I don't have a lot of time this month to unpack it all, but when I say manage God's resources, that's the, that's the big thing that you and I have to come to realize that everything we have is a result of God's hand. And today I won't read the scripture, I just want to announce my topic, and I want you to keep your Bibles open to Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. I believe uh, Sister Bennett read the scripture this morning, and our hearing and prayed for us in a most fervent way. Matthew 25, 14 through 30, we have a parable of the talents. And this story kind of goes like this, there was a man, who went on a journey and he gives out talents to his servants. He gives one five, the other two, and another one. He leaves for a period of time and he comes back to inspect to see what have they done with the talent, the currency, the gold, the silver that he had given them. When he came back, the one that he gave five, he made five more. Excuse my urban way of interpreting this scripture, he flipped it. <laughs> the one who had two, he had two more. The one he gave one, he went and buried it. He says, I heard you were a harsh servant. You're kind of unreasonable, so I buried it here it is. The story ends that the master was upset. Matter of fact, he takes the talent back. And that's kind of the end of the story. This is what I want to talk about this morning. Use what you got. Use what you got. That's the classic phrase many of us have heard in so many different areas of our lives. Use what you got. It, it is a phrase that has been applied in varied settings. It is what the coworker says to their stressed colleague who is always complaining about not having what they deem as sufficient resources, the co-worker just simply says, use what you got. It's the event planner that is forced to do a big event and once they arrive to the event, they realize they have little to no time and they have forgotten something critical and the event planner is forced to use what they have at their disposal. Use what you got is what the executive chef says to a line cook that complains that they have run out of a particular ingredient. There are times in life, beloved, when we don't have more. There are times in our lives where we don't have extra. And if we're not careful, when we find ourselves in those seasons where we don't have overflow, biggie and upsides blessings, it will lead us to start to believe that we don't have enough. But can I say when you don't have more, I want to call that this morning a inverted miracle that reminds us that we may not always need more. I want to remind us of that today, church, because if we're not careful, we'll live all of our lives looking for what's next, never appreciating what we have. Oh, how easy it is for you and I to begin to live pessimistically, always embracing the ideas and attitudes of being inadequate, suffering from insufficiency, and the balance of our lives always looks like that we are suffering losses, seldom if ever experiencing any gains. Is that you? Always complaining about what you don't have? that you fail to take inventory of what God has given you today, we are presented with a parable. Parables are one of Jesus' preferred ways of sharing spiritual insights. It's just a simple story 
with spiritual meaning. This parable comes in the section of Matthew's gospel where Jesus is answering the disciples' question about Jesus' second coming. When will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And Jesus warns them simply, be on guard that no one will deceive them and helps them to understand if I leave, I will come again. And Jesus challenges them in Matthew 24 verse 44 to be ready when the Son of Man will come because Jesus always comes back when we least expect. I think I ought to remind us of that. Jesus never sends us a memo that he's on his way back. He's not going to send us a text message. He, he will come suddenly. And in chapter 25, Jesus compares his coming to the eastern custom of a bridegroom arriving in the middle of the night. He concludes this chapter, therefore keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour when I will come. Chapter 25, 25 ends with the separation of the sheep and the goats. And in between all of this, the parable of the talents is sandwiched in between. This simple story serves as a mirror for us to assess the God and human relationship and how we manage the resources that God gives us. This is the first thing I want to lift out of this text. God gives. I believe I say that again. God gives. Listen, the story opens. He says, there was a man who has servants. He decided to give each of his servants talents. Talents in this text were representative of six months worth of wages. He gives them money, if you will. The man gives each of the servants something. This is, is a reminder to us, earthly possessions are an expression of divine trust. I think I'll say that again. Earthly possessions is an expression of divine trust. Notice, I didn't say favor. I didn't say that you're better than someone. But when you have something, when God blesses you and I with resources, it's an indicator that God trusts us. What a counterintuitive idea of what we think earthly possessions are about. We think earthly possessions show that I'm successful, that I'm favored that I have a higher status, that it's a tool for my personal satisfaction. Each time you start looking at the stuff that you have, what society calls your portfolio and earnings, it ought to be a reminder to you that God has trusted you. The master trusts the service, and this matter highlights how God gives to us. Notice, I'm going somewhere. God gives to us uniquely. Let the church say uniquely. The, the text says he gave each of them talents. Talents are a type of gold, a type of currency, if you will. God gives to each of us in a peculiar way, but yet a significant way. I'm talking to somebody this morning that God has given you talent. God maybe has given some of us influence, skill, connections, gifts, capacity, and one of the most extraordinary steps of Christian maturity is learning to identify what God has given you and learning to appreciate it. I know you may not have what somebody else has, but the fact is God has given you something and learn how to get up every day discovering the gifts that 
talents and the capacities that God has only given you. I want to tell you, you got to learn how to identify it. And once you identify it, learn how to cultivate it. Cultivate the gifts that God has given you. Some of us have the gift of administration. Cultivate that gift. Learn the latest tools of strategy and organization. Some of us, God has given us connections. And sometimes we use our connections to be elite and not to connect people. If God has given you connections, learn how to be a connector. If God has given you the gift of encouragement, don't keep all of that gift bottled up inside of you. Send someone an occasional text. Touch somebody as they're leaving out of the sanctuary and tell them to keep your head up. Whatever gift God has given you, identify it and cultivate it. God, God gives uniquely, but can I give you something else? God also gives discriminately. Notice how this master gives is representative of the careful stewardship of God. Look at the text again. The man gave one servant five, the second servant two, and the final servant one. The master gave to each of the servants, he gave to them differently. And can I tell you something, church? And nobody's going to shout on this, but God loves each of us enough not to give us too much. I, I know what nobody's going to shout on that. Be because we live, Lord, I want more. L Lord, I want extra. But notice how this master disperses these talents. He only gives each one enough that they can handle. And if we're not careful, we have this excitement and attachment to plenty. But God says, I'm not in the business of giving too much. God gives according to your unique ability. God knows what each of us is doing and our capacity for growth. And what you and I have to trust is God's prerogative and his nature on display. God is doing what he knows best is always better than what we think is best. I'm talking to my parents now. You, you know it's certain stuff that you can't give your children because they're just not ready for it. God takes that same parental approach to us. He says, I'm not going to give you more than what you can handle. And I know I'm giving out, but I'm going to give you just what you can handle. But can I give you something else? God gives uniquely. God gives discriminately. But also God gives sufficiently. There's, a, there's another principle here. The master gave each of the servants enough where they could be productive. This is what most of us forget. In life, it's easy to become preoccupied with what we call from where I'm from in Cleveland, watching the pockets, the lifestyle, and opportunities of others. Is that you? Always looking out the window of how God is blessing somebody else? Is that you measuring your life based on what somebody else is driving down the street? You, you, you upset because somebody else is driving a range and you're driving what you drive it. But listen, you may not want to be loaded down with Range Rover maintenance. It, it, is that, is that you looking at what somebody else is wearing and they have on this name brand and that name brand and you upset because what they have on but maybe you don't know that they are laden with label debts. Uh, 
I, I want to tell you, failing to realize that God loves us enough not to give us too much is oftentimes us missing out on God's blessings. God loves us intentionally so that God makes sure that God makes sure that we have enough to make a difference. This is the word. No, I don't have what somebody else has, but I have enough where I can be productive in life and in the kingdom. I, I ain't going to ask you to touch nobody, but look in somebody else's direction and say, no, I don't have what you have, and I'm grateful for it, but I do have enough where I can make my life and make an impact in the kingdom of God. I'm trying to tell somebody, you, you have enough opportunity, you got enough education, you have enough money, you have enough time to serve, you have enough money to share. I want to tell somebody this, you, you all forgive me, I was, I was uh, reading one of my partner's posts, he said, it may not be running over. But I thank God that it's not running out. And I, I don't know about anybody else. I, that, that got my soul happy. I, my stuff may not be running over, but I'm grateful that I've never ran out. I've never ran out of food. I ain't ran out of clothes. I ain't ran out of opportunity. And can I tell somebody something? I've never ran out of an opportunity to serve God. Tell somebody, thank God. That it ain't running over, but you ain't running out. That's a word. You have to learn how to readjust your perspective. Ensuring that I'm not going to get on the emotional roller coaster of comparison. Believing that I don't have enough. We, we, we used to sing an old song in the church it, after, after offering, and some of us can remember, we used to say this, all things come of thee, O Lord. And of thine own hand have you given thee. You just have to thank God that everything you have has come from the hand of God. Because i rather it come from the hand of God than somebody else. Because if it comes from somebody else, it won't last. Except the Lord builds the house, those that build it labor in vain. All things. God gives. Are y'all thinking with me today? God, God gives, but then secondly, you have to manage the opportunity. Let the church say manage the opportunity. The master and the servants teach us we are all gifted with sin, in sincere and distinct ways. Listen, when you read the text, it says, he came, he gave, and then the text says he left. Can I tell you something? God gives you and I space. God gives us proper space in order for us to be productive. God never handcuffs us to his will or his plans. God is a loving parent who instructs and inspires. And God says, let me leave room to see if they will apply what I've taught them. God gives you and me space to determine, are y take notes on this part, how we earn our money, how we spend our money, how we save our money, and then how we give our money. God says, listen, I, you ought to know that all money ain't good money. He, he, he says, have some integrity with how you earn your money. I, I want to quote this. If you have to cut somebody off to get the promotion, it ain't your promotion. If you have to do something slick and nefarious and you have to cover your steps and you didn't follow policy and procedure, that's not a good way to earn your money. I wish I had time to unpack this. Then how you spend your money. God says, hey, you, you ought to have fun. You ought to have leisure. Oh, I wish I had time. But you shouldn't be taking trips and your bills ain't paid. You, you should not carry a bag if you don't have at least that same amount in your savings account. 
Ain't nobody talking back to me. You out here living rich and famous, and then you borrowing for your light bill when you come home. God says, no, I've taught you better than that. How we save our money. Let the church say save. Save, save. save. Your granddaddy said, put some money away for a rainy day. Y'all believe it. They, get, they got that from Proverbs. The ant gathers in the, in the summer. When winter comes, the ant does not have to be out trying to find food. Church, you ought to save some money. Because life will happen where we will have to pull out more than what we normally would have to pull out. And then finally, we ought to give. When you earn it right, when you spend it in perspective, and when you save some, you never have a problem with giving. Because you're in a position where you can give. Nobody says amen on that. When you read Matthew 5 and 6, the Sermon on the Mount, the hallmarks of the Christian believer is not how well we speak in tongues. It is not how well we dance in church. It is not our vestments and what we wear that point to greater significance. The three hallmarks of the believer is praying, fasting, and giving. Each of these is a reflection of how we feel about God. I want to tell you, your money talks. What does it say about you? But, but he gives us space, but, he, but then he notice he says, take care of the stuff. Notice each of the servants were given talents. However, each of them managed differently. One servant was high capacity. He had five, and he got what? Five more. Uh, the second was productive. He got two more. The last was appreciative, but he buried it. The question for us to ask ourselves is this, what kind of managers are we with our talent, skills, opportunities, and money. Are you a person who seizes opportunity? You, when you see an opportunity, you just don't jump out there, but, you, but at least you know how to see it. You know how to count up the cost and say, hey, this is an opportunity where I can get more. At least are you a person who is a striver? No, I'm not, I may not take the big risk, but at least I'm not going to stay on the shoreline. I heard one of my friends say, the problem with the body of Christ is we are cruise liners that spend too much time on the shore. Are you a striver or are you a person who just plays it safe? Whatever God gives you, you take it and you bury it. But then spiritually, you got to watch out for comparison. We, we, this is what we don't see in this parable. We don't see the servants being competitive. We don't see them trying to compare what the other one has. That is often a deterrent to you and I being productive. If you spend your time always looking at the window of what somebody else has, you can never appreciate what you have in your own possession. I'm done when I tell you this. God holds us accountable for how we manage our resources. Notice the story, the master leaves the servants but then he returns. The master returns inspecting, inspecting what they've done, and he also returns with expectations. The master says, the text says, he came to settle the account. We, we miss this. God is going to come back to settle our accounts. The first servant says, hey, I got five more. The second says, I have two more. They are firm, good, and faithful servant. And the last servant says, hey, I buried it. Because I know you was a tough master. You tough on your people. Can I tell you something? Grace never condones irresponsibility. Even those who are given less are still obligated to use and develop what they have. I want to tell you something. Just because you have less than what somebody else has doesn't mean that you get off the hook of being unproductive. And listen, the third servant says, hey, you, you just a mean old servant. And notice what happens. The master judges the servant based on his descriptive commentary. 
He said, since you say I'm like this, give me my stuff back. And banishes him. Can, can I tell you something, child of God? The rest of the servants says, hey, this is what I did. And God says to us, if you think that I'm not going to judge you based on what I've given you, you have another thing coming. And I want to tell you something. We receive little when we play it safe for the kingdom. God becomes disappointed when we don't do anything with what he has gifted us. I came across this old Benjamin Elijah Mays saying, it must be born in the mind that the tragedy of life doesn't lie in not reaching your goal. The tragedy lies in having no plan to reach. It isn't calamity to die with dreams unfulfilled, but it is a calamity not to dream. It is not a disaster to be unable to capture your ideal, but it is a disaster to have no ideal to capture. It is not disgrace not to reach the stars, but it is a disgrace to have no stars to reach. Not failure, but low aim is sin. I'm talking to somebody. Maybe your Christian walk simply has low aim. Whatever we have, God will assess how we managed it. God says, I've given you so much. And listen, I want to tell you, God is not preoccupied with abundance. God desires us to assess what we have, use it responsibly and intentionally. Jesus, listen, we have to learn how to say, hey, God, I don't have what everybody else has. But God, I'm going to take the little bit that I do have and I'm going to use it for your glory. You, you missed it. You, 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 you missed it. Listen, God said you don't have to have abundance. But you do have to be responsible with what you have. And you think about Jesus. Jesus never had much. Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. He, he said foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their nests. But the son of man has no place to lay his head. Jesus didn't have a house or a hotel. All he had was 12 raggedy men from the wrong side of town. And Jesus took those 12 raggedy men with no place to stay. And he turned the world upside down. I, I want to remind you, Jesus didn't have much. He didn't even have a real earthly father. All he had was Joseph and a single mama by the name of Mary who was impregnated by the Holy Spirit and he became the incarnation. And then when you look at Jesus, he didn't have much. I'm done. All he had was a sinful world, a distant God, and a God that would not talk to humanity. And a humanity who could not talk to God. God Jesus said, I ain't got much, but I got to get them back in right relationship. Je Jesus says, all I have is a sinful world, a distant God, and two pieces of wood. He, he says, it ain't much, but I'm going to take these two pieces of wood. Go up to a hill called Calvary. Die on another man's cross. He said, I don't even have my own tomb, but I'm going to use somebody else's tomb. So since I took a distant world, a sinful people, and a distant God, two pieces of wood, and another man's grave, I tell you what I give you. I give you eternal life. And I want to tell you today, church, if Jesus can take a little bit and give you eternal life, imagine what you can do. To the glory of God our Father. This is the central truth of this sermon. Parables have one meaning. This is the central truth I want to give you. Commitment to Christ is proven when we use what we have at our disposal to promote God's agenda. When I ask you today, what do you have at your disposal? that you can use to promote God's agenda. And I want to give you some, from, some reflection questions today with this sermon. One, do we see our possessions as a matter of trust? 
Do you see what God has given you that is a sign that God trusts you? Or do you walk around thinking that everything you have belongs to you? This is the second one. Is God blessing me differently from my family, friends, and coworkers? Is that less of a blessing? Listen, you know, we get hung up when we start seeing somebody else blessed. But I want to tell you, it's no less of a blessing on you. God has blessed you if you take time enough to look at your own house. Managing our money is one of the most significant opportunities to honor God. How you manage your money is the way that you manage your money. Can God get any glory from it? And I'm done when I tell you this. Are you ready for God to judge how you manage God's stuff? Are you ready for God to judge how you manage God's stuff? Clap your hands if you receive the word today. We're standing all over the building. Today, if you're here unsaved, unchurched, today is a good day to say, I want to put my hope, I want to put my trust in God. You simply saying today by saying that God, I'm going to give you what I have, and I'm going to use it for your glory. Lord, little can become much in your hand. We're singing all over the building, Jesus. 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 At the mention of your name, every knee will bow. voices all over the building Jesus I see you I see you I see you Jesus for the one who's come. Come on, let's give God praise. Come on, let's give our sister a hand. You may be seated. You may be seated. We're closing out. We're closing out. Listen, church, we begin today our spiritual journey. We begin our spiritual journey on today. And I want to remind you as you depart, our hospitality has our fasting guide. We will go on a 14-day financial fast. Many of us, we've never done that, have we? Uh, uh, amen. L listen, it's a first time for everything. First time for everything. It it's nothing over the top. It's nothing that's going to hurt you. It's going to help you. Our spiritual journey team has taken time to put this together to help us. And then also, Simply, I want you to take this time as you read the scriptures and reflect and try to realign your finances, realign your finances. I want you and your family to pray about in what way God is moving you all to commit in our capital campaign. And then on this Wednesday, somebody shout this Wednesday. We have a special financial empowerment night for our church financial empowerment night for our church that I want you all to take full advantage of. Will you do that? Take full advantage of because it was not teaching us how to give. It's teaching us how to handle our money, period. Amen. Look at somebody say, amen. A amen. Amen. We just need to know how to manage what God gives us. Because remember, we know that it's not about more. It's about how we handle what God has given us. So that's this Wednesday at 6.30. Let's stand. Let's rest on our feet. I want to give you this blessing. Remember, the hospitality has your financial guides as well 
as it is on our church app. Can I give you this blessing? May the grace of God, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest, rule, refresh, and reform this day and the days ahead until we meet at Jesus' feet, the bishop of the church, the bishop of our souls. Go in peace, go in love, go and serve. May the Lord be with you. See you on Wednesday night. Good morning, New Hope. Our 14-day financial fast is here, and we're excited about it. Join us Monday, October the 3rd through the 17th, as we take a financial journey together. As you know, New Hope is entering into a unique season with big vision, and we are committed to do our part. For the next two weeks, we want to embrace this financial time of fasting as we align our hearts and focus on current practices on how we can better represent God as we continue to build faith and share love. We have brochures in the foyer and in our church app that will provide you some tips and encouragement on how to successfully complete this journey. It all begins tomorrow. Get ready. Let's go New Hope, reaching for a better future. Hey New Hope, do you want to learn how to make your money work for you? Become a better financial steward and be a blessing? You're invited Tuesday and Wednesday, October 4th and 5th at 6.30 p.m. as we listen and glean from financial experts on how to maximize what God has given us. We encourage you to come and bring someone with you. We can all use assistance managing our money better. We will have class for all of our youth. Bring the family and join us this week, Tuesday or Wednesday, in Conway and North Little Rock at 6.30 p.m. We'll see you there. Our 95th church anniversary is up on us. And it's no question, God has been so good to us. But let's kick off the weekend right. And you know how we do it. We celebrate. We'll have our church picnic at the Glenview Community Center next door. We have food fun, and games. Come out, family and fellowship. We want to see you there. Then, on Sunday, our church anniversary will climax with Pastor Carlos L. Kelly of the Beulah Land Baptist Church. He will preach our 8 a.m. service, and our special guest will be the Reunion Choir. Dr. Terry Mackey of Pilgrim Progress Baptist Church of Phoenix, Arizona will preach our 945 and 1130 a.m. services. We are sure to have a good time. You don't want to miss it. God is doing great things here and it only gets better. New Hope, we invite you to get connected and stay connected to one of our many social platforms. We invite you to get connected on Twitter and keep up with the latest happenings at New Hope. Become our friend on Facebook and see what we've been doing in our community. Watch us on YouTube where you can hear clips and sermons from Pastor Parks. New Hope Social Media, building faith, sharing love.